Okay, I think we're good to go. Hi, everyone. Hope you guys can see us on the internet. Uh, my name is Crystal. I am the aquatic sourcing specialist here at PetZone, and I will be hosting today's talk, um, which is gonna be on aquarium keeping and conservation, featuring some of the guest speakers here from Project Piava. Um, so just to do a quick little introduction before we start, Project Piava is a nonprofit organization that supports the development of environmentally and socially uh, sustainable fisheries in the Amazonas state of Brazil. They have worked very closely with uh, Cardinal Tetra and Discus fisheries in that area, and they've been actively involved in policy work, research, and in telling the stories of the fisher folk there. So I am very honored to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, first off, we have Jackie Anderson, who is the Education Materials Coordinator for Project Piava. Jackie has had many years of experience with aquarium design and maintenance as a former professional aquarist, and she currently maintains aquatic animal life support systems, and she's going to be our main speaker for today. Joining us as well is Scott Dowd. He is the executive director for Project Piaba and a conservation biologist at the New England Aquarium in Boston. He studied the Cardinal Tetra fishery and has been actively involved in conservation work for that fishery for over 20 years. And he also established the Home Aquarium subgroup for IUCN's freshwater fish specialty group. So Scott and Jackie, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna pass that spotlight over to you for the presentation and afterwards, if you have some time, we'll be doing some Q&A as well. So just hold as you get started. All right, great, thank you everybody. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. I have a uh, presentation. Up. And pardon the cooing. <laughs> I have a bird who lives with me and he makes a lot of noise sometimes. So, um, welcome everyone. My name is Jackie Anderson. I'm the Education Materials Coordinator for Project Piaba. And I just wanted to, uh, to give a little talk today about how conservation and aquarium keeping can, uh, can be linked and how our choices as aquarium keepers can help drive conservation. So what Project Piaba does, we're a nonprofit 501c3 corporation. We don't buy the fish, we don't sell the fish, but what we do is we have studied the fishery for decades and we have worked um, to, to use the fishery to drive habitat conservation, which helps mitigate the effects of climate change and which helps alleviate poverty and actually which satisfies all 17 of the UN's goals for sustainable development. Um, Home aquariums are a pretty big deal. They're, we're all here today because we're passionate about home aquariums, because we keep home aquariums. And it's, it's a big deal throughout the United States and throughout the world. There are about 14.7 million American homes that have an aquarium. And during the pandemic, that number actually shot up a lot. So a lot of people are keeping aquariums. And it's a big money industry. It's an 18 to $20 billion industry as of 2014. So that includes not just the fish. It's more than fish. It's all of the tanks and the stands and the filters and the sand and the gravel and the plastic castles and the pirate ships. It's a lot of stuff and it's big money. So where the, the kind of poster, oh my goodness, stop hooting. <laughs> the kind of poster um, study for Project Piaba is the Rio Negro um, in Brazil, which is the largest tributary of the Amazon. So just to sort of orient yourself, this is South America and the river that runs east-west and is the cover, is kind of the color of... Um, of a latte is the Amazon, and the river that runs kind of northwest, southeast, um, and is the color of black coffee is the Rio Negro. And the Rio Negro is where this aquarium fishery that we've been studying for so long works. Now, it's rainforest habitat, and rainforests are fantastic places. They're hot spots of biodiversity. They're huge carbon sinks, which have a huge capacity to help mitigate the effects of climate change. There's endemic species that live in the rainforest. It's important for medicinal plants and research. And you can't ignore the fact that 3.8 million people live in the state of Amazonas. And there's all kinds of really cool animals that live there, too. There's birds, there's frogs, there's reptiles, there's um, insects, there's pink river dolphins, there's 
mm -hmm. uh, giant river mm -hmm. otters, which are frankly mm -hmm. terrifying. They're about mm -hmm. as tall as me and, and very mm -hmm. scary. Um, and there's lots of fish too. And not just fish like food fish and exciting fish like red tail cat or pima and things like that, but a lot of fish that are appropriate for home aquariums. Now, when we talk about aquariums and, and home aquariums specifically, people want to know about sustainability. And what sustainability is, is the ability to be sustained, supported, upheld, confirmed, um, and environmental science. Basically, from an environmental perspective, it's not messing something up. So what people want to know is, are fisheries sustainable? And one of the biggest things that we think about all of the time when we think about fisheries is we think about... Um, we think about what goes into these fisheries. Do they have a negative impact on the environment where they are um, being practiced, and and how do you how do you mitigate those effects? So most of the time, people think about fisheries. They think about like trawling and seining, and and when they think specifically about aquarium fish, they think about um, they think about cyanide fishing and dynamite fishing and a lot of those things that are destructive to coral reef habitats. What they don't think about is the Rio Negro aquarium fish fishery, which is a completely different animal altogether. It's sort of an area, um, it's, it's been practiced since the 1950s, and it's done by rural families who live in villages throughout the Rio Negro region. And you could take photos that were taken in 1959, or slide photos, and put them alongside photos that were taken, you know, months ago, and they look largely the same, except for, you know, you might see somebody wearing a, a t-shirt that's got, you know, a, a graphic on it that <laughs> that's modern. Um, but for the most part, the fishing techniques themselves have not changed. So when we think about fisheries, this is really a very different kind of thing. When you think about, you know, those, those small scale artisanal fisheries where people are capturing the fish by hand. And when you think about those hugely environmentally destructive things like seining and trawling and dynamite fishing and all of those kinds of things. So when we talk about sustainability from a fisheries standpoint, Basically, sustainability is not messing something up. But what we aim for and what we hope to achieve with this fishery is better than sustainability. We hope it actually has a net positive environmental impact. And we actually have a whole lot of science that proves that this is true with this particular aquarium fish fishery, about 30 years of data and um, papers that go back to this. So again, the Rio Negro region, we're, we're zooming in on this because this is our main study area. Um, but this is a this is a river system that is governed by a huge amount of seasonal variation. So, and when I say a huge amount of seasonal variation, I mean, um, excuse me. <laughs> Pardon. I mean a lot of water level change. So it goes from um, it goes. It has a seasonal variation of up to 10 meters, which is almost 30 feet. So here's a picture that in the top right corner um, is a picture of a village called Himansu. And Himansu is um, at the bottom, like there, there's the river at the very bottom of the photo, right? And then you, it, the village itself looks like it's up on a tall cliff. Um, and that, that cliff is actually, you know, where the water level is when the water level comes up. So basically in the Rio Negro and throughout the Amazon basin itself, the river goes up and down with the flood and drought cycle. So when it's dry, less water in the river, the you know village is up on top of a, a huge sandbank. When the water rises, that village is you know mostly underwater. And, and the house that's in the bottom right corner, you can actually see a water line. So during the high water season, all of the houses are underwater and people sleep from hammocks that hang from the um, from the, the rafters in, in the houses. So it's this means a lot, not only to the people of the region, but also to the animals of the region and specifically to the fish that are part of the home aquarium fish fishery. And so the fish's habitat changes so much when there's so much more habitat available and resources available and food available when that water goes up into the trees and floods the forest and then all of that food becomes available to those fish. So carrying capacity is basically the amount of something that can be sustained by any particular type of environment. Now as fish keepers we think about 
that's, you know, you've got your, your aquarium that's got a couple of fish in it, your fish are happy. Um, and then you've got an aquarium that's overcrowded. If you um, happen to have about 400 gallons of filtration on a small tank, <laughs> you may be more familiar with the graphic on the left. Um, and some of us have been there and done that. <laughs> so basically when you think about it in the wild, it's the same thing. And this is what this habitat looks like. This is one of those flooded forest areas near the village of Darakwa. And so basically in the high water season, the river invades the trees and floods the forest and all of this habitat is available for fish. And they respond by spawning a lot. When there's extra habitat, extra food, extra space, the fish are happy, boom, 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 babies, babies, babies. And so then the water levels go down and then all of that habitat sort of constricts. Some of those fish don't make it back into the main channel of the river and those fish are basically doomed. Um, so here is a video of the same puddle uh, near Daraqua, and here you have, this is ankle deep water, and look at all these fish that are trapped in this puddle. <laughs> you've got cardinal tetras, you've got a couple different species of hemigramus. I think there's a Beckford pencil fish that's going to go by in a few seconds here. Um, but anyway, these are valuable fish, and these valuable fish are just, they're, they're, they're beautiful from an aquarium standpoint, they're beautiful from a looking at these fish standpoint, but they're also doomed if they're trapped in this puddle. So basically what happens is we have this, this thriving fishery that has existed since the 1950s when uh, Herbert Axelrod went down and was like, wow, look at these fish, wouldn't they be cool to have in an aquarium? And this fishery has sort of gone on ever since with you know a couple of changes to it that are mostly driven by market factors. But this fishery has existed for a very long time and basically people are capturing those fish that are not part of next year's fish population because as you know, those fish that are trapped in the puddle that are being caught are doomed, they're not next year's fish at all. Taking those fish from the population doesn't affect how many fish you'll have next year because they're not gonna survive, they're not gonna spawn. Um, so basically these fish are captured, they're sent down river, they end up at these export facilities, they end up getting boxed and packaged up and sent elsewhere in the world where they're you know, sent to wholesalers, sent to pet stores, and then sent to home aquariums like, like our aquariums at home. And this is a big industry. So this, here's a paper that came out, um, this came out last year. And basically um, this paper looked at specifically the fish um, export business from Amazonas in Brazil. And what they found was that for the, for the almost 10 years between 2006 and 2015, they found um, $23 million in fish were exported from Brazil. And that's a big chunk of change. Now imagine if there were a, a conservation organization that were to go around writing checks, $23 million is a lot of money to write to you know, preserve habitat in a biologically important area. Now in the Rio Negro fishery, this, this means a lot of people. It's about 40,000 people who are economically impacted. So that's not just people who are doing the fishing, that's people who are involved in all of the aspects of the fishery, the transport of the fish downriver, all of the, um, you know, working at export facilities, working with, you know, moving, you know, the boats and all of that stuff. And it represents about 60% of the income of the region uh, that we're talking about and protects about 46,000 square miles of rainforest. And so um, if you look back at historical data of how many fish are exported year to year, um, those numbers were sort of difficult to keep track of in the 90s. And, and Scott can tell you, some of his work um, going down there in the in the early 90s and seeing this, it was kind of a mind blowing amount of fish that were that were coming out of this fishery um, every year. So the the thing about this though is that in the 90s, like it's, you know, million, we have some numbers that indicate 20 million fish. Um, we have some numbers that indicate more than that fish that weren't counted as they went, you know, around the hub at Barcelos, fish that didn't get counted might have been something like 90 million fish. Now imagine taking 90 million fish out of the habitat year after year after year after year, and there's still 90 million fish the next year. That's the very definition of a sustainable fishery. Now the things that have driven the numbers of fish being exported down have been market factors. So in 2006, it was about 26 million fish. And then in 2015, it was 2.7 million fish. That's a huge drop off, but it's not related to how many fish there were in the habitat to catch. It's related to outside factors like the reproduction of cardinal tetras and other, uh, other livestock of these species that are part of the um, aquarium fish industry. However, they can be produced somewhere else. So now the wild caught fish have to compete with the same species of livestock that are produced elsewhere. 
So why is this important? Why do we care about you know what what people are doing in remote areas of Brazil? Now here's a photo that I took out the window of a plane at you know early early in the morning, like 1 a.m. Um, in 2016. And what this is, it took me a while to see what I was looking at because I, you know how they have like a map in the back of the, in the seat back behind in front of you in, in an airplane. I was looking at the map and I was like, wow, I'm over, you know, nowhere. I'm over the middle of South America. What, what is this that I'm looking at out the window? Cause it was, it was like that the whole way. There were like these bright orange lines everywhere. That is fire. Um, so that is fire that's burning along the riverbanks of, um, of some river somewhere in South America in 2016. And this is important because a lot of the ways that people make a living, so again, that's about, what did I say, 3.8 million people in the state of Amazonas. Those people enjoy the same things that we enjoy, like living and sustaining their families and, and having you know a way of, of supporting themselves. And a lot of the ways that people make livings in the Amazon are generally destructive for the environment. There's things like slash and burn farming, timber harvest, gold mining, urban slum migration, and all of that urban sprawl that's happening in rampantly in other parts of the Amazon is largely not present in the Rio Negro region, mostly because there is this aquarium fish industry that's providing a sustainable source of livelihood and that's providing um, it's providing a way for people to to make a living and support their families, but it also depends on having a clean, pristine, healthy, functioning forest river ecosystem. You can't have a wild fishery of cardinal tetras existing alongside of you know those environmental catastrophes that I showed you earlier. So um, again, here's what it looks like: it's it's rural families who go out and they fish and they catch fish by hand. You can't do any of like the modern, um, you know. The, the modern like industrial fishing practices that, that happen in other parts of the world because you just can't drag a seine through the flooded forest. You'd be snagged up in sticks and leaves and stuff. They're literally catching the fish by hand or catching them in these little traps um, with table scraps. And it's, it's a hugely sustainable fishery from a standpoint of the fish populations, but it's actually a beneficial fishery when you think about the fact that it's displacing all of that that urban sprawl and that deforestation and that environmental degradation that's rampant in other parts of the Amazon. And also it's culturally significant. So the families have been participating in this fishery for so long. Here's um, some photos. These were taken by a gentleman who's been on a couple of trips with Project Piaba um, down to the Rio Negro. And they have this, this festival um, that can be best described as like a dance competition. And it's not for outsiders. It's not something that you'll see like posters of in, in you know, Target or Walmart. You won't see it like on TV. It's not made for, um, it's not made for outsiders. It's a celebration of the fishing industry for the people who participate in the fishing industry. And it's best described as the biggest dance competition you've ever seen. Um, and so I'm just going to, um, I'm going to play the video <laughs> and I'm going to let you experience this. There's, there's a, a place um, in Barcelos that's the, the Piaba Dome. And um, Piaba means, it's, it's like a, a word for like little minnow. They're, they're fish that you can't eat. They're just, you know, the Piabas. And um, these fish are, are so important to the people there that they celebrate them in this giant dance competition. And there's like teams and cheering and they like dance and sing. And it's, I'll, I'll play it for you. <laughs> And yes, her bikini was on fire on purpose. Um, so this is the only place in the world where I've ever seen a pyrotechnic bikini. Um, and it's part of the aquarium fish celebration of, of the region. So it's all like, you know, it's this huge spectacle of celebrating the aquarium fish industry. And it's, you know, it's in the middle of the jungle. It's, it's amazing. Um, so it, 
this is all very good stuff, but there are a lot of threats to the aquarium fish industry of the Rio Negro right now. And right now, one of the biggest threats is the captive production of the same fish. So cardinal tetras, uh, rummy nose tetras, a lot of species of fish that come from this region. There's about 250 um, species on a list that you would recognize as being something that's a commonly kept aquarium fish. Um, they can be produced elsewhere. They can be aquacultured. They can be caught or they can be um, raised somewhere else and sold for less money and transported for less money than it takes to get them out of the middle of Brazil. Um, a lot of times when a fish has gone, you know, 400 kilometers down the river and been in a plastic tub in the rainforest, a lot of times they've they're, they're not as healthy as, as the competition. Um, it's expensive to get fish out of the interior of Brazil. And also there's wild caught is sort of a, there's, there's a perception issue with it. It's, it's a dirty little word that, you know, people hear wild caught and they think, oh, that must be bad for the environment. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, bureaucracy and laws. And then um, fish that are smuggled out of other countries and fish that are, um, that are on lists that are not allowed to be exported like zebra, um, zebra plecos and things like that. All of those um, types of transgressions into the legal export and aquarium trade um, are active threats to the science and understanding of, of the fisheries. And here's another big scary one that I hope we don't have to talk about soon. Um, but this is a, a house resolution that passed in uh, February this year, and it's the America Competes Act. And basically this contains some amendments to the Lacey Act, which is um, among among other things, it, it, um, it talks about the, the Lacey Act governs how animals are imported into the United States and, um, and what happens, like how, how they're transported across state lines once they get here. Um, so for the, for basically the purpose of the Lacey Act is to protect native habitats and wildlife against invasive species um, and to protect vulnerable and endangered species from over harvest in the wild for the, you know, for the pet trade or for, for any other reason. So it also affects things like hunting and stuff like that. But basically there is a amendment or a few pages of amendments to the Lacey Act that are contained within this uh, House resolution um, that would hugely damage the aquarium fish industry and actually the pet trade in general um, and would change the way that, that animals are imported into the United States in a way that would basically eliminate the aquarium fish trade of the Rio Negro and that would have like huge catastrophic effects because the United States is one of the top four importers of tropical fish from Brazil. Um, so it would, it would be a huge blow to this industry um, should it pass. And it passed the House and um, is actually in committee right now. So now the Senate and the House are um, working to, um, to, to put together two bills that they, they pass separately. So the Senate passed another bill that does a lot of similar things, but doesn't have the Lacey Act amendments in it. And, you know, among other things, it's a, it's a 7,000 page document, right? But the House resolution does have the amendments to the Lacey Act. So they're, they're putting it all together right now. It's in committee. So it's not too late to, um, to write a letter to your senators and tell them how important this is to have it not be included. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that Project Piaba is working on to, um, to sort of help foster this fishery. So, so again, we've been studying it for decades. We've been looking at what the aquarium fish industry has been doing and studying you know, the, the numbers of the fish and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, but we do a lot of outreach. We do a lot of interpretation about, about the aquarium fish industry and about this fishery in general um, at uh, trade shows and activities and stuff like that. We work with AZA institutions to help them develop exhibits and interpretation surrounding aquarium fish. Um, because a lot of times, you know, people, a, a million years ago, I worked at PetSmart and um, everyone that came in would, you know, anyone who wanted to buy a Cardinal Tetra, I would talk to and I would be like, hey, so um, if you were going to buy a Cardinal Tetra, would you rather buy one that's wild caught or one that's raised at a, at a aquaculture facility? And every single person that I talked to said that they wanted to buy an aquacultured fish. And I was like, okay, but well, why? And every single person that I talked to said, because they care about the environment. And it was like, well, wait a minute, here's a, here's a clear case where the wild caught fish actually, actually provide a, a huge conservation benefit for the habitat and actually help, um, you know, the species in general. So it's not just the fish that benefit from the habitat protection that the fishery creates, but it's also 
all of those endangered species like the like the jaguars and the you know the the tapirs and the the charismatic megafauna that live in the same rainforest habitat are also protected by the conservation benefits that the fishery provides. Um, so it's really about messaging as well as in getting people to realize that not all fisheries are created equal and that not all fisheries are bad for the environment. And in this case, this particular fishery has a huge benefit to the environment. So we do that. Um, we also were instrumental in, in helping to create um, a fisherman's cooperative called Ornapesca in 2010. And what it is is it's it's a it's a cooperative. It's kind of kind of like a union, um, but it, it's it's where you know the group of people who are invested in the fishery can get together and talk about um, you know things that benefit all of them. So um, you know and get like group, you know buying power on on stuff and like you know working with finding people to purchase the fish and transport the fish and stuff like that. So they can do that kind of thing. But it's also hugely important for helping us to disseminate information to the people who are doing the fishing activity. Um, and one of the things that I'm, that I'm most proud of that Project Piaba has been working on in, in recent years is our best handling practices. So again, I mentioned that, um, that a lot of times when the fish go through that process of being um, of being captured and um, taken down river and, and handled and, and put into an export facility and then shipped, that's by the time they get through that whole long supply chain, they've seen some stuff. And sometimes they're a little bit worse for wear for that. So um, what Project Piaba did is we sent a team of vets and professionals down to the region to observe the fishing activity and to observe the fish in the river and to observe the fish at each stage of the supply chain and make recommendations about how to improve the health of the fish throughout the supply chain. So here's our team and uh, they're looking, what, what are they looking at? They're looking at the stuff that's going on with the fish, internal parasites, external parasites, because wild fish have parasites, right? But they can be easily treated. And um, so looking at each stage of, of how the fish are treated, now think about this, when you scoop a fish, out of the river or when you scoop a fish out of your tank when you pick it up in a net that fish goes flip flop flip in the net and scrapes a little bit of its slime coat off of its body and then that opens up that fish to secondary infections and parasites and things like that and if a fisherman is working with these fish they don't necessarily know that is going to happen because when they've picked up the fish in the net by the time the fish sees the effects of that injury it's weeks down the road and that fish has already been moved on to someone else. So those people don't even know that. So what Project Piaba has done is identified those, those possible places for improvement and then sent a team of, of professionals to disseminate this information in a culturally appropriate manner. So what this means is that, you know, we have a team of Brazilians who are, who are working with the Brazilian fishermen um, so it's not like we're, we've gone down there and said, oh, the way that your granddaddy taught you was wrong. It's more like our knowledge of fish biology has changed a lot in the last 50 years. So let's, let's look at, you know, let's, let's have modern, you know, biological tools like microscopes and, and show people what we know about fish biology. And so the, the trainers go through this, this highly technical training, um, of, fish biology and changes that they can make to um, to the fishery or to improve the health of the fish. And then they get all of the things that they need to go through this. So like thumb drives of information, tablets, projectors, microscopes, and all of the teaching tools that you need to help um, to spread the information. And then they go out and they do these trainings. So the, the trainings are prioritized to Ornapesca members, right? So that Ornapesca makes it easy to uh, find people and to organize these trainings and say, hey, we're having a training, you know, next weekend can come, you know, and people will, will come. Um, and then basically the idea is that people who are not Ornapesca members who then go through these trainings become Ornapesca members so that at the end of the trainings, you can say that Ornapesca caught fish are captured by professionally trained fishermen. And then in theory, that fisherman can charge more money for that fish because that is a professionally caught fish. It's handled in a particular manner and it is healthier. So the next phase of this is to do this stuff with exporters. And again, a lot of the things that we do are at the intersection of time and money. So this is on the list. It's going to be happening very soon. And the, the issues that fish face at export facilities are different than issues that they face at other parts of the supply chain. This is a place where they need to have special types of food where they're um, recovered from, you know, the transport downriver, where they're, um, and, and 
where they're held for a little bit while they're being acclimated to aquarium conditions as opposed to river conditions and things like that. And so basically one of the biggest challenges is, is getting good nutrition in these areas because it's, it's hot, hotter than you would believe um, in the middle of the jungle and a bag of fish food that's left out is, you know, not only rancid and hot and cooked, but also often full of bugs. Um, so it's not as healthy as it could be. So that's another area for improvement, which is going to be happening very soon, hopefully on our next, um, our next trip to Brazil. And also um, another thing that's being worked on very soon and on our next trip to Brazil is geographic indication and traceability. So basically what this means is that a fish um, that's captured in a particular, a particular uh, area of the flooded forest or a particular creek or a particular tributary of the Rio Negro can be tracked from its point of capture by the person who's caught it to each stage of the supply chain, to the exporter, to the importer, to the wholesaler, to your aquarium. And that is something that's so cool for us in terms of knowing where our fish come from, from people who are interested in keeping biotope aquariums. And um, it's also hugely important in being able to track the health of the fish um, through each stage of the supply chain. Also, um, a few years ago, we did this thing uh, with Carbon Company or Carbon Co. We had a rapid assessment done um, and discovered that the forest that's protected by the, the area where the fishing activity is happening protects about seven or sequesters about 7.6 billion metric tons of carbon. And this is a big deal when you think about the mitigation of climate change and how uh, airlines are big polluters and are always looking for ways to um, to decrease their carbon footprint, this could um, have the ability to impact shipping and freight costs if the true cost of the aquarium fish industry um, is able to offset the, you know, carbon pollution created by, by airlines. So that's another step that's hopefully happening soon. We do a lot of developing relationships. So again, with AZA institutions and, and in terms of helping design exhibits with uh, the aquarium fish industry in terms of, you know, creating uh, changes in perception with importers, with exporters, with retailers, with people who are who are on YouTube. And the, the pandemic has hugely changed the way that people um, acquire information and the way that, you know, like we've we've been posting videos every Friday for Wild Fish Friday and the, the engagement that we've seen has been unreal. And so it's like, you know, I've had people have to teach me how to hashtag um, <laughs> and do stuff like that. And like, you know, giving talks and, and uh, you know, I, I've done some some AZA um, presentations and, you know, it's kind of like I'm, I'm here in my in my kitchen with my pigeon cooing in the background. And it's like, you know, we're we're trying to trying to save the rainforest here um, from our from our kitchens. Um, but there's the huge impact that this fishery has on the environment. Again, you know, twenty three million dollars. That's that's huge. Like imagine being able to write a check that big to preserve the rainforest. There isn't a there isn't a conservation organization in the world that can write checks like that to, to just say, hey, protect the rainforest. Here's twenty three million dollars. Right. The aquarium fish industry is doing that by putting its buying power behind aquarium fish that protect the environment. And it's about forty six thousand square miles and seven point six billion metric tar tons of carbon and 40,000 people. And that's a big deal because these people will find some way to support their families, um, like it or not. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, people think about environmentalism and they think about saving the rainforest and they, you know, it's easy to sit in your own kitchen and say, you know, save the rainforest. These people shouldn't cut it down, you know, save the rainforest. These people should, should really make better choices with, with the habitat. But really what it comes down to is, is people, need to, people need to support their families and people need to, um, to have a way to live. And they're going to find that no matter what. And if the, aquarium fish, if the aquarium fish fishery of the Rio Negro disappears, all of those people who live in the state of Amazonas and who live in these communities that are, that are practicing sustainable fishing right now are going to have to find something else to do. And a lot of times in the Amazon, those other things to do are environmentally destructive. So this fishery is directly offsetting those destructive things in this region. And that's a scary thing to think about losing. So um, this year we're, we're going back to the Amazon. The last time that we were there was uh, 2020. And um, that, was a, that was a bit of, of a trip because literally as we were coming out of, um, as we were coming back down the river and into like cell phone, you know, 
reception and, and um, you know, the, the ability to connect to the rest of the world on our cell phones um, is when the news of COVID started to break. And, you know, nobody, everyone was kind of like, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, not realizing that it would affect every part of our lives for the next several years. Um, so finally, this year, uh, September 24th to October 8th, we'll be going back to Brazil, and we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of things. We, we desperately need to get our scientists down there. Um, we're going to be working on rolling out a traceability app that we've been developing, so the ability to track those fish through each part of the supply chain. Um, we're going to be continuing our best handling practices in at least two new fishing communities that we haven't trained yet. Um, and we're going to be documenting newly available species in the aquarium fish industry. So um, Brazil recently changed its export laws. They, um, for, for years, had a, um, they had a white list, so a list of species that was allowed to be exported. And as of May 2020, they switched to a black list. So now it's instead a list of fish that are not allowed to be exported. So that really opens up the ability to export species that were never put on the list in the first place, um, species that are still in the works of being identified, and species that, you know, look enough like species that had not been on the list that people were afraid to, to catch them and export them because they're like, oh, I'm pretty sure that this is, you know, this particular, you know, species A of Moncalzia, but it looks enough like species B, which is not on the list, and I'm not going to catch it because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, so there's going to be a lot of work to do. Um, so we're going back. And if you want to go with us, there are enough, there, there's spaces for, for other people to be able to go. And so you can uh, email Scott, take a screenshot of this right now and uh, email us. And if you want to be included on the trip, um, it's going to be a working trip, but it's going to be fun. And you're going to get to see where aquarium fish come from. Um, here's a cool thing. This is a new species of Munchausia. So as I was going through... Um, as I was going through a lot of videos that we took on the 2020 trip and making our, our Wild Fish Friday videos, I came across this fish and I was like, I have no idea what that is. Like, if you dropped this in front of me and didn't tell me where in the world it came from, I would be like, that is probably an African cichlid. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and so when I was trying to identify it, I was like, I can't even, I can't even place the genus of this fish. Um, and so I, I sent it to um, to a friend of the project who's an ichthyologist, and he was like, I don't know what that is either. So he sent it to another friend of his who is an ichthyologist, and he came back with it. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm actually, like, in the process of describing that fish. Um, that's an undescribed species of Munchausia. So really cool. Just swimming around out there in the wild. And here's another undescribed species of Munchausia that's from uh, near Daraqua. And this one looks an awful lot like Munchausia coletti. Um, which is a fish that I, I actually have some of them in my, in my tank. Um, they're a gorgeous fish, but this one uh, is slightly different. You can see the, the dark line on the bottom of it extends much further up the body um, than Munchausia coletti, where it stops kind of at the anal fin. So really cool. Um, there's so many fish out there that we don't even, you know, there's 94 described species of Munchausia, but that number is going to go up and up and up and up and up um, as these fish get scientifically um, looked at. There's another way that you can participate. Um, Amazon Smile, we're actually a charity on Amazon Smile, so if you order things on Amazon, um, you can help save the Amazon, um, the rainforest, not the company. But um, basically, Amazon Smile donates a portion, if you log in through Smile, it donates a portion of what you spend on Amazon to a charity of your choice, so you can search Project Piaba and, and then um, Amazon will donate a, a portion of what you spend to uh, Project Piaba, which is huge because we're an all volunteer organization. So we don't get paid for this. We're doing this in our spare time. I took the night off of work to, to do this talk tonight. Um, so it's, it's a big deal to us. We also have a GoFundMe going on to help sponsor, um, we're calling it Sponsor a Scientist. So if you go on to uh, GoFundMe, you can search Sponsor a Scientist or Project Piaba, and either way will pop up. Um, and so we're, we're looking to, to get help to, to send our scientists down to, um, to work, to do those, the, the traceability rollout and to do the, um, best handling practices training in the new villages. So, um, we've got a lot of work to do. We're, we're you know, we're, we're doing some nutrition studies. We're doing a lot of things and, and it would be vastly helpful to have, um, money to send people to do those things. So, um, that's happening. Also, there's a free documentary on YouTube, and it's on Amazon Microcosm's uh, YouTube channel. And so through a lot of support from the aquarium fish industry, um, th 
they were able to, to publish it for free and you can watch it. It's great. It's got some beautiful footage of, you know, wild habitats and, and it's definitely worth a look. Screenshot it and uh, take a look at it. And you can always email me. You can check out us um, on projectpiaba.org. Um, our YouTube channel, again, we do Wild Fish Friday. So every Friday I publish something, um, a video of, of, you know, wild fish and wild habitats. And it's, it's useful, like, even if you don't keep an aquarium, it's just beautiful to look at. And if you do keep an aquarium, it can be hugely inspiring for looking at what, you know, the habitat that the fish um, live in and require in the wild. Also, we're on Facebook and, and Instagram and those things. So um, that is us. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. Scott, do you have anything that you would like to add? No, I think you uh, covered it really well. I think we can see if anybody out there has any questions. And I'm sorry about the pigeon noise. He uh, he has a, a nest <laughs> and he was sitting in it and just like, it's like a little plywood box that's like a blast chamber. He was just like, whoo, coo, coo, coo. <laughs> so I took his nest out. He's fine. He's just eating a giant bowl of food. <laughs> no worries. That was that was really good. Thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and your pigeon sounds very happy. <laughs> <laughs> He's very happy. He's so um, cat and happy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess I had a couple of questions, um, kind of just to follow up with the presentation. Um, so I think you talked a lot about the cardinal tetra fishery. Is there anything mm -hmm. that's like different for the discus fishery? Because I know you guys do work with that as well. Is there any like differences to that? Yeah, so uh, cardinal tetras, they, they come from slightly different habitats um, and they, they also have different biologies and life histories. So cardinal tetras, are one of those fish that's fast reproducing. They're, they're fish that come from up in the flooded forest. So there's they're the ones that there are literally zillions of them, like an, an, a completely unknowable number of them in the flooded forest habitat. Discus, they're, you know, they're a parental care cichlid. There's fewer of them. They have to be a little bit more uh, carefully thought about, like you can't export 90 million discus a year the way that you can cardinal tetras. Um, so that it's a little bit different like that. Also, there's a huge difference in the price. Like cardinal tetras are sort of a... Um, a volume fish like I you know I have a tank of about 30 of them and and you know that's that's how they look great if you had just one giant discus and and there there are some um and Scott can tell you more about this too but if there are some of the export facilities where we've seen discus that are like you know the size of dinner plates and they would just absolutely blow your mind <laughs> to see these fish but they're they're so expensive to export because you gotta like you can put one fish in one you know giant bag um and they're, you know, they would cost so much to ship that if you got it and something happened to it, you'd just cry. <laughs> yeah, I definitely can relate to that since we work with we work with both at Pet Zone. So there's yeah. definitely a difference in how you handle a discus and a and the cardinal. Um, but yeah, so what's the season like for the wild cardinals and discus, like, I guess, month wise, like when is it typically available for, for the U.S.? They, um, so, so this is actually something that Project Piaba has been working on a lot is, is in um, removing the seasonality of availability. So the fishing activity, the, the actual catching of the fish can only happen at certain stages of the, of the, the flood cycle. So it has to happen like as the water levels are, are, you know, dropping out of the flooded forest. They can't, it can't happen at high water because then there's just, there's too many places for the fish to go. There's too much water. They can't, you know, you can't catch fish because um, you can't find them because <laughs> they're, you know, in, they're just everywhere, but they're beyond where you can reach or see them. Because um, also the, the thing that I'll mention about the Rio Negro is that it's, it's black water. So you can be standing in knee deep water and the water is so dark that you can't see your feet. Um, so that makes it, you know, basically you're catching fish by, by what you can see and you can only see, you know, that much of the, of the water column. So it's basically they're, they're fishing in the small puddles, um, but that's only like, you know, October, November is the peak of the fishing. Um, so that's actually going to make this year's expedition quite different. So in the in past years, we've gone 
um, we've gone on the expedition in uh, January, February, and that's, you know, around when like the, the fish festival is happening in Barcelos and we've done it specifically so that we can see that. Um, but that happens after most of the fishing activity is done um, because people, you know, don't want to leave the fishing, leave their way of making a living to go party. <laughs> right. So it happens a little bit after. Um, but this year it's going to be, you know, we're going to be there in the, in the peak of the fishing time in October, September, October. So because the fishing can only happen in certain times of year, um, that's when the exporters can in source their fish. That's when they can get fish. But if an exporter has a small facility, they can sell out entirely of all their fish. And our peak in the hobby demand is in the winter, um, especially in the, the northern states when it's cold out, people are stuck in the house. And unfortunately, that's um, during the high water season when the exporters can't get fish. So if they've already sold all their fish, they kind of have a problem. And if an importer wants to buy Cardinal Tetras and they, they call an exporter in Manaus and they say, we're out of fish, that, that's a problem. So we've been, there are some, there are a couple of exporters that have um, a much larger capacity for holding fish. Um, where they can stock wild fish during the collecting season and maintain enough stock to help supply their market demand year round. So that's what we're encouraging the exporters to do is to buy the fish while they can get them, but stockpile them so they can, um, they can supply their cl clients year round and not sort of force them to have to shift to buying fish that are produced outside of Brazil. Um, so that's a that's a good point that you've that you've brought up. Thanks. Um, I guess another question too was, um, and I, I come from a seafood background, so I'm pretty familiar with like a lot of the fishing, um, you know, different practices and kind of the whole like farm raised versus wild caught kind of conversation. Um, but I was kind of curious about, I guess, like freshwater fisheries specifically. Are there any fishing practices that would be considered like good or bad, um, specifically with wild caught fisheries? This is something we're working on too. And most of the egg scatterers, uh, rasboras, barbs, tetras, danios, uh, rainbow fish, um, all of those guys, they're basically um, niche dependent. Um, in other words, they'll they'll kind of automatically completely saturate the niche. Um, and if fish are removed, there are always an offspring that are ready to come up and take those, those positions. Other fishes like cichlids, catfish, stingrays, they need to be monitored a little bit more in terms of uh, impacting their population because they're longer lived individuals and they have fewer young. So I'm guessing like with the freshwater fisheries, it's more of kind of like looking at the reproductive stages and kind of like looking at how they reproduce rather than like the exact method of fishing. Sure, kind of sure. There are very few examples of the aquarium trade being responsible for uh, a decline in a, a species population. So the, the aquarium trade in general is, um, for freshwater anyways, it's a very low threat to target species and the environment. Oh. We lost Crystal for a second, but I, I, I see in the, in the chat, someone asked what type of clothes would one pack for the trip? Um, I, I packed a lot of bathing suits because <laughs> um, you, you spend a lot of time in the water snorkeling and looking at fish. Um, so whatever you're going to be comfortable in being very hot and very wet um, for two weeks. <laughs> Sun protection is important too. A, a brimmed hat and uh, good waterproof sunscreen. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of sun down there on the equator that, that we're not used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the best, the probably one of the best things that I ever brought was like a, um, like a rash guard for, for wearing under like a wetsuit 
Um, and I just wore that in the water most of the time because, you know, you're snorkeling, you forget about your back. Um, and, uh, you, you know, your back is out of the water and the rest of you is under, so you don't feel that you're baking, but, but you are. <laughs> Here's Max. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. All right, I'm trying to come back up here. It seems Crystal, uh, her computer, I guess, crashed. Um, uh, so that's about it for the presentation. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, very in depth presentation. I truly appreciate it. It's it's uh, really amazing to really see how it all breaks down and how it works. And um, I feel like a lot of our viewers are going to want to get up and support wild fisheries now because really it makes a big difference, not only in the quality of the fish, but in the quality of life of the people who work with these fish. So yeah. that is, that is amazing. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can yeah. get up here. Are you guys, uh... All right, there we go. I'm popping up here. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, let's go ahead and uh, end this up here. I want to first of all thank Jackie and Scott for joining us and uh, presenting for Project Payaba. Uh, absolutely wonderful. And if you guys have any further questions regarding um, any way to contact them or, or get some of the fish they're speaking about, uh, we have that information as well. Uh, you guys want to go ahead and say goodbye to our audience? Yeah, thanks, folks. Thank you. For, for tuning in. I appreciate it. And uh, buy a fish, save a tree is our slogan. So keep that in mind when you're maintaining your aquarium and uh, and uh, buy some wild cardinal tetras or better yet, come uh, join us down in the field and, and see it all firsthand down in the Amazon. Yeah, definitely. It's it's the, the most important thing to, to think about is that, you know, environmentalism and, you know, our, our aquariums are a are window to natural habitat, but they're also helping to protect that natural habitat when you're conscientious about where your fish are coming from. And it's one of those one of those um, opportunities that we have as as fish keepers and environmentally minded people to make a difference in the world. You know, I think a lot of people are tired of hearing that conservation is shutting the water off when you're not using it or turning the lights out when you leave the room. Conservation is much more than that. It's the, it's the choices that we make every day and how they can have a positive impact on the environment um, just by choosing wild caught fish from the Rio Negro region. You're protecting that habitat and you're providing sustainable livelihoods. Absolutely wonderful. We truly appreciate your presentation, Jackie. Uh, Scott, thank you so much for putting you know your time. Right. Thank you. Uh, have a wonderful yeah. evening. We'll be sure to uh, spread the word. Thanks very much. Take care. Right. Thank you so much. All right. Our pleasure. Have a good